Good evening. All right. I'm going to just fold that out. Speak loud. Did you hear that, Gene? <laughs> okay, welcome to the next to the last program of the Oaksville Historical Society programs of 2013. Um, I just want to tell you this is a very good day for me because today this book I wrote for kids last winter was published and available on Amazon.com. So, uh, first we'll have uh, a bit of business. I'll make some announcements. Our, uh, a very big day is coming up on the 6th of October, Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. It is going to be the opening of the uh, Old Townhouse on Bell Hill Road in Odysseo. Uh, as you might know, the Old Townhouse was virtually abandoned uh, a few years back. Uh, citizens in the town thought it had historical value. It was on the National Register. And so the town of Otisville ended up giving this building to us with the stipulation that we would fix it up uh, during a time of uh, near depression. No one, a lot of people thought we could not do it, but we have done it. And this uh, celebration coming up is a way of showing the people who have supported us uh, what their generosity has accomplished. So a building that was condemned, basically, you couldn't go in there, uh, is now a useful building. And most important for the Historical Society, we now have state-of-the-arts storage facility in the basement for our invaluable archives. We have another um, program coming up November 17th. 7th. 7th. November 7th. And I think this is going to be a lot of fun for a lot of people. It is called uh, the uh, 98 Ice Storm Revisited. <laughs> uh, I don't think those of us who live through it have forgotten it yet. <clears throat> okay. And in line with that, I'd also like to point out, uh, I look around at the folks here, and if I can remember the Brownfield Fire, <clears throat> probably most everyone else here can. And there's going to be a program, uh, is it Thursday show? Next Thursday, Next the Thursday third. Next Thursday at the, at the Highland, something or rather out of 302. It's a motel just out of 302. It's Highland something or other. Resort. Huh? The Highland. Anyway, uh, I think if you remember that fire, if you didn't, it was Maine's major fire. And I can remember standing on Bell Hill as a little kid uh, watching that fire. And in those days, Bell Hill was pretty good. You could look and see in that distance. You cannot do that any, anymore. So in line with some of our mini business meeting we have, uh, we, we did talk about all the money we raised and put into that building, the old townhouse. And now, is, is our treasure in here? No. No? So then we will have no treasures before. Secretary's report, are we prepared for that? Okay, go on. Jean Paul. Most efficient like secretary. Um, our last meeting was. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Yeah. All right, I pushed it up by my ear. The Northfield Historical Society on Thursday, June 27th, that seems like a year ago, at the community hall, Kelly Zelensky called meeting to order. President Henry Hamilton was unable to attend because of illness. Jean Hoddle read the minutes. I'm sure that's exciting news for everyone. Ethel Turner moved the minutes. The accepted the motion was seconded by Kelly Zeminski. The minutes were accepted as read. Jean Hankins reported on a follow up meeting with Don Perkins. And you may remember he presented a program on bonds, on old bonds. And uh, uh, Perkins was interested in visiting a number of local bonds, and Jean acted as tour guide. 
We had an update on the progress of the townhouse. The building has been picked up, set aside, a basement done, and a new foundation installed. Also, an addition has been built on the back of the building to provide ADA compliant access and stairs to the basement. A driveway to handicap parking in the rear of the building was completed last week. A well and septic system will be completed later. Work will soon begin on the archive room. Of course, it's all ready for us right now, so on the 6th we'll get a chance to see what has been done. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit of it because it doesn't seem relevant. Uh, we, we did talk about the Strawberry Festival, which is to be held on July 14th. And if you've never attended the Strawberry Festival, you need to because we have homemade biscuits and whipped cream, and it's delicious, and lots of strawberries. Jean Hancock Hankins introduced John Madhu to discuss Nathaniel Hawthorne's boyhood in South Castro in a presentation entitled A Brief History of the Hawthorne House and Association. He showed pictures of the man in Hawthorne House, reminding us that Hawthorne spent many carefree days in May. He went on to tell the Society about the founding of the Hawthorne Association in 1922. The Association is holding they too held a strawberry festival in July to raise funds. He spoke of the difficulties of raising money for work on the Hawthorne House and increasing the membership of the association. Refreshments were served after the meeting. Respectfully submitted. Thank you. When I was in American literature at the University of Maine, I had to write a paper on an American author, and they all, we had to justify why we chose that author. I chose for fun. And the professor asked me to justify my choice, and I said, well, we used to go fishing in Oversea. <laughs> I move we accept the minutes as read. Second. Okay. Well, it's rules. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So now I think it's about time for um, Gene Hankins, Dr. Gene Hankins, to come up and enlighten us on the history of Jughead. I'm going to read this mostly, and I am going to be following my Dixie Williams, who is here, yes, and then, and then my Nick Williams, uh, Nick, Nick Edwards, with you, or you're there, but I can recognize you. I didn't think, I thought you were going to be old and distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is going to be a slideshow, and, and, and my part of it, and Pixie's part will also be this. Yes, and I've got this gadget which I've never worked before, so bear with me. Um, recently, some of us revisited Jugtown, which is both the name of a river and an area. The road, which extends from Oak Hill Road in Otisfield through to Eads Falls Road on the Crooked River in Naples, is mostly discontinued, only a mile and six tenths long. Jucktown Plains is the name of an area in, within the Jucktown Forest located in Casco, Naples, and Otisfield. The Jucktown Forest, which is owned by the Hancock Lumber Company, encompasses 5,000 acres and contains 19 miles of trails open to the public. I'm going to ask you, there are a lot of people here who think they know the forest better than I do. If you do, and I'm wrong about something, let me know afterwards. Thank you. I know we have a lot of ATVers here who have a different perspective, too. I know Larry Nadeau here has found the solid holes that I could not find, for example, when I looked last year. Joining in the discussion tonight are Pixie Williams, who is Otis Field's first botanist, and Nick Edwards, who is both an Otis Field resident and a Hancock former employee. My part will be to present the history of the Jugtown Road, based largely on research done by my late husband, Dave Hankins, who died in 2005. He originally presented this in the Otisfield Historical Society meeting in 1997. Hickson will follow by telling us something about Jugtown's special botanical importance. Finally, Nick will explain the Hancock Lumber's involvement in the forest. My own interest in Jugtown reaches back to 1996 
when Dane and I first walked the length of the road from the Otis Field to the Naples Inn at Oats for Eats Falls. We took pictures and our dog along and compared what we found with an older account written by Edna Robinson Rosefield, probably in the 1930s. We found it in an interesting and unusual part of town, almost completely flat. It's the only part of Otisville that doesn't have hills. It has no human houses, no houses. It's full of sandy trails and pine trees, crisscrossed with trails and logging roads. After we did the walk, they burrowed into the Otisville archives to find out more about its history. He followed with a slideshow on Joe Towns, I said, in November 6, 1997. This is based largely on that. If you don't have, and you don't own an ATV or a snowmobile, the chances are, there are some people with you who do, do not. Uh, chances are that for you, Joe Town is a place you've never been. But in recent years, it has been a popular place for recreational vehicles. As these signs, I'm not going to try pushing the button uh, too fast. And that's the first one. These signs, these are only a few, many you'll see, like this will show you. This is a major intersection. It's sometimes hard to read them, and I discovered the snowmobile trails have different names for roads than the Hancock people do. It's quite confusing. A couple, um, a couple of years ago, I started exploring Jugtown Road again, and this time discovered there were lots of ways to get in there. I walked in from the River Road in Naples, from the Eats Falls Road in Casco, from Oak Hill Road, from Bishop Road, from Poplar Ridge Road, and most often by a nice little road that starts near the Otis Field Transfer Station on Oak Hill Road. That's my favorite way in. I walked there mostly on weekdays, usually in the morning, and I generally leave Saturdays and Sundays to the ATVers, the dirt bikers, and in the winter, the snowmobiles. Fortunately, it's a big enough area to accommodate everyone. My main source of information about Jet Town is Danish report for 1997 talk, especially the detailed map and the outline he left. The map that is over there on that table, which you're going to see a slide of it. And he took 40 uh, color photos. You'll see most of those tonight also. He also researched Otis Fields town records, which were fortunately are very complete, and they are an important source for this work. He also made good use of the Otis, not Otis Field, but Otis family papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Several members of the Otis family, including James, Samuel, and Harrison were first proprietors or owners of 18th century Otis Field, or who was named. Uh, finally, in the Historical Society archives, we were lucky enough to have an account of Jugtown written by Ms. Edna Robinson, probably in the 1930s. In his 1997 talk, Dave relied heavily on her account and I've done so too, so I'm going to read her words. She writes very well, rather poetically. And I, when, when you hear me speaking poetically, you know it's Edna speaking, not me. Why is it called Jugtown? I'm going to answer this question first. The name Jugtown goes back to the middle of the 19th century, long before Prohibition. There were two theories, both involving Jug. One, the first theory is that the natives of Otis Field, accompanied by a jug of hard cider, conducting rifle practice by the mill pond. One of them drank too much cider, and instead of shooting the target, shot the jug. The other theory is similar. When the mill in Jugtown was completed, a rifle match was held to celebrate. The prize was a jug of rum. The losing contestant expressed his unhappiness by shooting the jug. Now, if any of you have heard more versions, tell me afterwards, or you will add them to the, to the account. When he gave his 1997 presentation, Dave made a pretty convincing case that the Jugtown Road might be, 
might be the first row in Otisphere. Each falls on the Crooked River was the birthplace of Otisphere, the geographic starting point. See what do. There, okay, there's a, there's a map showing in black. You can see the boundaries of present day Otisphere in yellow, the boundaries of Otisphere as they were in 1771. Um, the origin of Otisville is pretty complicated, so I'm going to simplify it for you and say that it, in 1771 was the date that Otisville was granted to a group of Boston businessmen, among them the Otis family. The proprietors or owners of the new township all stayed in Boston. For them, the new town was primarily an investment opportunity. And they made their money by selling 100 acre lots to prospective settlers. And none of them ever got up there. Instead, they hired George Pierce to serve as their agent. His job was to survey the new tract of land and divide the new township into 64 new lots of 100 acres each. Pierce, who became Otisville's first flat settler and very wealthy man too, built a house at Eads Falls, which is down in the bottom, very bottom corner of the map, uh, followed by a sawmill and grist mill sometime after 1773, and then he set to work on the rest of his responsibilities. You may remember that according to the dictates of Massachusetts, the proprietors were required to set, you may not remember this either, the proprietors were required to settle 30 families in the new town within five years or forfeit their grant. They were also required to reserve one lot for the first settled minister who was required to be a learned Protestant. <laughs> other, other lots were reserved to support the ministry in town as the church, a grammar school, and Harvard College. The reason the Harvard College was it was the place where the learned Protestant ministers were trained. Uh, the Otisfield case, the proprietors decided to give Harvard College the lot off the swamp, off the Swanville Road, which is a swamp. It is now known as College Swamp. They thought that was a, a, a good way to get rid of land that no one wanted. Uh, realize the crucial importance of a sawmill, though. The proprietors dedicated one lot, number 65, for that purpose. Lot 65 is at Eads Falls, and it went to George Pierce. In 1776, the proprietors proudly tried to make the rest of Otisville accessible to Whit Whitby settlers, requested that Pierce build a bridge over the Crooked River. The next year, the proprietors ordered Pierce to cut the road on lot 65. Let's see if this will show up here. Here it is. See the star? David Hyatt got that little star in for me. Thank you, David. Uh, from, that's lot 65 running northeasterly to lot 16. Up there, that is very close to Spurs Corner. And then up northerly to lot number 83. It is not quite the Jugtown Road, it is not quite the present state Route 2121, but it is plausible. Lot 65 down in the bottom is the mill, mill lot where Pierce lived. Lot 16 is south and west of Spurs Corner, and lot 83 is the northeast corner of Spurs Corner. The driving distance from East Falls to Spurs Corner today is several miles, but if you notice the crow flies, it's under two. Today concluded that the Jugtown route was a logical place for the first road. For the urban settlers, one big advantage of, of that route is it's almost completely flat. It's a big advantage when travel is by foot, ox cart, full horse. Uh, worked. This is Dave's map, the, uh, the original is on that table. This is a map he made in 1997 based on some intensive research and mathematical calculation. 
Whether or not the first road was a Jugtown road, clearly there was some sort of road built there before 1828. According to town historian William Spur, in 1828 the Ghouls have already built a mill on the Smith Brook, situated eight rods east of the Jugtown Road. It would have been of considerable importance in the early town because by that time the mill at each falls had gone. That's the mill that Pierce built. And the mill in Rayville, built by Daniel Ray in 1787, was some miles away. The importance of mills to early Otisfield or any other early town explains why the town fathers commissioned a survey for a new Jug Town. We have the 1828 plan for that new road in our town records. On that table, there's a long sheet of paper sticking out. Uh, it's kind of paint is a photocopy of the original. Remarkably enough, the 1828 survey map almost exactly lays out the present Jug Town Road is shown on this map. It runs from Oak Hill Road past Gould's Mills. It crosses the Cotter Swamp Brook, which is now Smith Brook and it skirts the Tea Swamp and crosses the Coal Brook before it reaches East Mills at the Crooked River. East Mills is not quite on this map. So you're talking over on the Naples side? I'm sorry? You're talking on the Naples side where this mill was versus the Casco side? I, 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 can't, I can't hear you. East Falls runs Casco to Naples. East, 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 East Falls. Right, so you're talking the Naples side of the Eats Falls or the Casco side is what's going on. It's. I, 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 I could. I, can you leave that? To, I'm going to have to do that later. Okay. So I'm sorry. Uh, just two years ago, another document turned up concerning the route of the Jug Town Road. This was an 1831 statement by the selectmen that they had laid out an alteration in the route, formally laid out, leading from the foot of Oak Hill, so called, past Colonel Eves Mills back to Isaac Barton's. The route is called the Eves Road. This is confusing. So this is, I don't think, yeah, you're, you're probably confused too. It is a slightly altered of 1828 plan of the Jugtown Road. The Jugtown Road goes to Eves Falls, but it's not Eves Falls Road. That's a different road. After this, for a number of years, the Jugtown area must have been a flourishing village, all because of the mill. Built in, eight, in 1834, this is only eight years later, Naples split off from Otisville, meaning the Jugtown Road no longer linked two towns. And after 1840, the demand for new houses and new land in Maine was diminishing. Until the 20th century, late in the 20th century, Otisfield's highest population was, was in 1840 when it reached 137. What is it now? Oh, it's over 1600, but not under 2000. That's, that's 1307, that's a lot of people in 1840. So who lived, who lived in Jug Town and how many? This is hard to figure out. The 1871 map of Otisfield shows only five houses. Those of Ira Smith, Joshua Harmon, Simon Glor, and Sylvanus Lovell. Um, by extracting a little more information from Spurs history and Edgar Robinson's account, we can find at least six more houses. They're all on this map. Plus, the saw is shown on this map. But by 1871, Jugtown was on its way out as a viable part of the town. When Edgar Robinson wrote her account, probably sometime in the 1930s, only cellar holes were left. And I can't find the cellar holes. Larry the Doe can find the cellar holes. What Dave did at this point in this talk, and what I'd like to do, is read some excerpts from Edgar's account, and at the same time, take you on a virtual tour through the contem contemporary drug town, as shown in 1996, David and I walked it, and in 2013 when I walked it. Edgar Barnes' account is titled Old Sellers of Jugtown. She lived incidentally in a large brick house up on Bishop Road, which 
where John Hart once lived, just off Oak Hill Road. She, I think she was a school teacher for many years. I don't think she ever married. I don't know where she's buried. I don't know much about her. But here's how she started out, rather poetically. Oak roads, old trees, old homesteads, old cellars of Chuck Town, which once comprised the neighborhood of nine or ten families. It now lies on the discontinued road leading from Oak Hill Road to East Fox. On making a pilgrimage to Jerk Town, you can now find many reminders of these old homes in the old south. This is not exactly a romantic vision of Jerk uh, Town that she is writing about. This is 1996, and this is what we found at the very north end of the road. This is our car. We still have that truck. And uh, that's, you, you can drive in to the power line and park there. It's a very rough road. I don't advocate you do. I don't think this is the best way in. But well, this, this is the official way in for the truck to come. And this is me and my dog, Gideon. You'll see another golden retriever in later pictures. It's not the same dog. But this is 1996. And we are heading for the power line and just starting off. And here we're going into the woods. And here is one of the many large puddles. This is one reason this is not a good route to go in this way. Because some of the puddles, I swear, have a current right through the middle of them. Uh, it's, not, it's not the way. Uh, back to Edna Robinson. You will first come upon the birthplace of John Robinson, who later lived in East Falls. When John was in the Army with the 30th Maine Regiment, he reached Winchester, Virginia. The next morning, after his arrival, Sheridan started his famous ride. Now, you can take the little blue line, and you can see on the map approximately where this site is. All, this is a, that's all this is, is a stone wall. I couldn't find any stone wall here, either. And this is about all we can find today. And, Rob, and then Rob, the north of Robinson. In the field is the cellar hall of the James Smith's home. <coughs> Along the way, we see the delicate pink of Bouncing Betty, sweet enough for any bride, and who knows, it may have been thus honored in the old days. This is the James Smith. Now this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is not the James Smith. This is the Hamlin House. We're getting there. Across the road, several tall, graceful trees in a line tell us we are approaching the site of the <coughs> early homestead. They are like giant harp strings when nature plays the song of the wind. This was the home of Black William Hamlin. Are there any flowers left? Yes. Surprisingly, a little clump yellow iris still lives to greet the visitor in springtime. Calvin Baker built this house and was then occupied by the Anthony family. When I went there last year, this was taken in 1996, when I went back last year, I couldn't find any of the family since then. So, does it look just like that? Okay, good. No, let And we did not find any yellow iris growing there either. And for any red roses, we found no flowers at all. Next on the right was the home of Ira Smith, a blind veteran of the Civil War. This is all we could find there. Here, up here are a band of gillian trees. Jam one of the leaves for a strange, unusual fragrance. Over the way, more red roses grow on the sandy bank. This was the Joshua Harmon place and the birthplace of Ellen Sands, now in Seattle, a house that built by her grandfather Smith in 1862. Below here, Smith Brook still runs on to the Crooked River. The trout still lurk in its waters. A Phoebe builds its nest under the old rich timbers. Above the rocks, ripples, and ferns. 
Wagon wheels no longer rumble over the bridge or jump down to the brook to give the horse a drink. Sometimes fishermen do venture into the vicinity. Above the bridge, there used to be the Dan and Spawnbell and Jonathan Smith. Here, they caught the red spots in the mill pond. Here, the Holden boys came on uh, midnight nights to escape. This is, this is not this is not Gideon, this is Pedro, this is last year. They look pretty much the same. Uh, back in 1996, when we got to the Smith Bridge, Dan spent considerable time trying to find the remains of the mills built by the ghouls along with the dam that went with it. He was relying on what's called the minutes of the road as laid out by the Otis Mill Selectmen in 1823. They wrote the copies over on that table which stated the Jugtown Road at this point should be laying out south 24 degrees and east 80 grass to Coles Mills. This is Bay in the middle of the woods counting eight grass to the dam site. And this is what marks the, the dam site. I'm a little skeptical. I couldn't see much there, but uh, that's as close as he could get. Okay, back to Edna Robinson. Beyond the bridge was the home of Charles Lovis on the left. On the right, the Anna and Lori house stood. This was the birthplace of Walter Hammond. On the low sandy stretch, the Jug Towners and Mr. Hammond said that Frost used to come in early. Walter's father, William Hammond, ran sweet corn using gravity's hunt self fertilizer. And a little further on the west side of the road is the old sheep pasture where Daniel Holton drove his woolly flocks. From Oak Hill, just this side of Cold Brook, lived Sylvanus Lovewell. He had red hair and whiskers and a trained horse that he took to the fairs. The horse was made to dance by the music of the Jews' harp. Sylvanus often visited the Hamlin family and entertained them with the Jews' harp and clogging. I think that's fancy, isn't it? The town boundary, I'm just showing the Jug Town boundary, the Hancock boundary, because it reminds us that Hancock owns this. Uh, the town line between Otisville and Naples appears about now. We had trouble figuring out where it was. There's no monument, no granite post, just a couple of red signs, very red, legible, stapled to a tree, letting snowmobilers know where they are. Most of this walk, most of the walk is in, no, about half, it's about half and half, half of those two and half angles. Now we come into the plains of Jugtown, over a narrow winding road. This is 1996, and you can see a lot of trash in the field, old tires and so forth. They are no longer there in Harvison. Uh, now we come into the plains of Jugtown, uh, over a narrow winding road, with coarse grass growing between the tracks. In places, the sweet purple fruits of the sugar pear of lying the bay. Among the scrub pines, many pitch pine knots have been gathered and have sent forth their tiny incense from crackling open fires. Around fallen, decayed logs, the blueberries fragment in the July heat, while over the plains comes the high, clear calm of the sparrow. Oh, damn, Peabody, 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 as he runs the road to East Falls. And this is Dan measuring a loose pack with his hand. And here is the naval scape of the, of, of the Jugtown Farms. The Jugtown Road do, do, does go on for maybe a quarter mile or a few houses, but uh, it's not very interesting. And, we took, we took no slides at that point. What can we conclude about Jugtown? First, it was one of the earliest roads in town, possibly the very first. It reached its height of activity between 1830 and 60. There were probably no more than 10 houses ever on the road. And the sawmill, which may have been a grist mill also, was its only industry. When the population of Otisfield began to decline after the Civil War, Jugtown was one of the first 
villages to experience it. I'd like to add just a few words about how surprised I was when visiting Judd Town after an absence of 17 years. Uh, during this time, it seemed the forest had been moving fast to take over the last remaining signs of human habitation. The stone walls are hard to spot. The cell poles are getting very hard to find. On the good side, there's almost no litter anymore. No, no rubber tires, no trash, at least not compared with 1996. Third, the snowmobile, ATV, and dirt bike traffic has increased a great deal, especially in the last 17 years. On the positive side, this means that the many trails through the forest do get used and they get maintained. On the mine side, the trails are subject to serious erosion problems from the heavy use of off-road vehicles. This time around, I found much deeper mud puddles and steep gullies that are much more evident. If you walk in here to explore, you may not think there's much there. But the Chuck Town Road does connect us with the days of the town's early cats, and there are still some reminders if you look hard enough. Aside from its interest to historians, the Ducktown Forest exists today mostly not because of its man-made object like cellar holes and walls, but because of its trees and plants. And so it also interests botanists like Pixie Williams, who will tell you why this is a special place for her. And Nick Edwards will finish by telling us how the Hancock Company managed it manages to keep this large forest healthy and productive. And we'll take questions for all of us when Pixie and Nick finish. Thank you. Not in their habit, but 
And in some respects, they're quite similar. And I'm just going to pass around these two packages to let you look at them. And the names are on the outside of the plastic bags. And I want you to look at the needles, discover which are longer, which are shorter, uh, which are more supple, slender, which are stiffer, and perhaps more rigid, more subtle to breaking. And then I want you to look at the cones. Now the cones are egg-shaped, one to two inches tall, and they look very, very similar. They're hard, except for one respect. And pitch pine has a nasty little bristly prickle on the underside of the scale. You wouldn't want to sit on the cone of a pitch pine. Let me tell you, particularly this young one. So I'll pass them around and let you take a look at them yourself and compare them. Uh, and I'm just in uh, commenting on uh, Jean's wonderful uh, historical commentary of Judge Down. It's interesting, and it would be nice, kind of interesting if we have the time to discuss what brought the settlements there. Because the, and this, uh, the people there, the soil is sandy, and it's very poor agricultural soil. The one positive feature Jean pointed out is the land that's flat. But was it, we'll never know, was it the lumber on this particular place that brought the settlers? They certainly put up a few sawmills, which was interesting. Uh, but we can only speculate about that. Now, uh, as we go along, What's so special about Jug Down Plains? In the first place, I'm going to tell you, and I'll remind you again and again throughout, that uh, the uh, pitch pine is the signature species of Jug Town. And it's a remnant of a bygone ecosystem. Uh, I think that perhaps now that we could start to look at the slideshow. Yeah, he's going on, and that's great. And uh, I'm going to show you the first slide, uh, which is a nature conservancy map of the Jugtown Plains. Now, this is the southernmost section of what Jean was talking about. And you will see the town lines. This is a modern map. Uh, a lot of it is owned at this present, but it's all owned by Hancock. But a lot of it is within the town of Naples. Now remember, years ago that was Casto. And a tiny bit is Casto. Most of it is in Ovesby. And this particular section contains a lot of wetlands. And it is down here, through this section, that we see the Crooked River. And let me tell you, now you know why it's all crooked. <laughs> Look at the Billy Wattles all the way through down there. And that's all a good deal of wetland. In here, there is more wetland, and I will discuss that and show pictures of it to you. And uh, one curious thing is that caption, I don't know whether you can read it or not, but it says Acadian swordgrass, and it was considered recently by the Nature Conservancy to be a rare species. Well, I looked up Acadian swordgrass, sighing that they had put together a um, botanical name because it made very be difficult for me. But uh, I couldn't find anything. I spent days looking for Acadian swordgrass. Couldn't find it. And finally entered the 21st century just yesterday or the day before and Googled it on the computer. 
Joke Town, and, what, and I have a whole tremendous historical collection of very ancient uh, botany volumes, and so I was really surprised I couldn't find it because it's a historical designation that's just dropped off the map. But Google said, a K Jucktown, Acadian sword brass moth. Well, here I am looking for a grass, and it's the name of a moth. But it still is an unsolved problem because that must be an ancient designation. And uh, I still don't know what Acadian sword grass is. I'm inclined to believe that it's probably one of the bulrushes, perhaps one of the common bulrushes. But anyway, I still have to solve that particular problem. And so, uh, we, this again is what the Nature Conservancy had, was particularly interested in preserving this special section with all the wetlands and also originally a lot of uh, pitch pine, which is rapidly disappearing. And so, um, what was all this? What's the history of it? And it's the remnant of a very ancient type of vegetation that goes back to the Ice Age, which is kind of exciting. Now, what happened at uh, the, uh, during the Ice Age, what was the Crooked River? You probably all know it was a glacier. And as it moved along, it dropped a lot of sand on either side of the glacier, and the, certainly as it melted. And that sand has existed to modern times. A lot of it has been used and mined out, but it, there still is a great deal of sand there. And those sand, sandy edges are called lateral moraines. And where a glacier finally ends and dumps its final load is a terminal moraine. And believe it or not, Cape Cod is a terminal moraine of one of the fingers of the glacier that went out to the sea. And if you look at it, the map, oh yeah, it's just the way the sand knelt in the semicircle, of course, you know. Uh, interesting. But, uh, so, you have a lot of sand around the Crooked River in this present day. Now, what happened out in the sea and along the coast is we all know that uh, as the ice formed, a lot of water was bound up into that, and the shoreline of the sea receded way, way out. You can see with Cape Cod, you know, in one of the glaciers going all the way out there. That's quite something. And uh, as the sea level went down, it exposed a large, huge, sandy plain that for existed for thousands of years. Well, of course, it's not just going to be a sandy plain, but uh, eventually uh, flowers, which have very plastic genetic, will be, will adjust to living on a sandy plain. And that's exactly what happened. And this flora is called coastal plain flora. And uh, pitch pine in this area is one of the signature species. And uh, it reaches its northernmost tip uh, in Acadia National Park, where it uh, grows on a rocky promontory. But we are the northernmost sand plain with pitch pine along the eastern coast. Jumptown Plains, and this is why it is botanically significant. Two of the very interesting places that you can see more of this type of growth and the, the birds that are associated with it, which are extremely interested in, and particularly insects, dragonflies, 
butterflies, moths that are specific to this area. You can see them in the Kennebunk sand plains, and I would, if you haven't seen that, I would suggest you go and see the beautiful blazing stars, the northern blazing star, which is a rare plant, and a coastal plain flora. And also, uh, a little closer too, you can go over to Freiburg and Brownfield and see a lot of pitch pine and an accompanying little scrubby oak tree called bare oak, which we don't have in Jumptown because of the soil type is slightly different. But uh, that too is a typical coastal plain flora. And what other, what other plants are in this group? Blueberries, button bush, a lot of the aquatic plants that I deal with. Uh, all kinds of common things, and you will see later uh, what their environmental requirements are. Now, I, I think we should move along <coughs> to the next slide, and this is courtesy of Lee Dassler. And the Ovis Field Conservation Committee uh, decided several years ago to get interested in, in this area because we had heard, and I think Hancock was concerned too, about just what Jean showed, the old tires, um, cars that were dumped there. I know that Christmas trees were cut in there illegally and taken. And it was, the place was abused and no one was paying attention to the ecological uh, importance of this. So we went in and had several trips, and the first trip, I remember, is quite famous because we formed a sort of uh, train of automobiles, and we went in on the river road and over the snowmobile bridge, and we moved a little too fast, and we lost Jean Hankins' car. And poor Jean Hankins was wandering around the periphery of Jugtown trying to find us, and she's never forgiven me for that. And it was my fault. But uh, subsequently to that, we got a hold of, of Hancock, the Nature Conservancy, the Department of Conservation in Maine, uh, OCC sponsored this, our conservation committee. We got a hold of uh, Casco Open Spaces, uh, what remained of uh, Casco's conservation committee, and I see she's here, and that's wonderful. And oh, this field conservation, I've already mentioned that, and also Oxford Soil and Water. So we had quite a group of people come in and uh, accompany us, and we had a wonderful time. Now, uh, I hope you notice as we move on to the second slide that this road is very sandy, and it's typical of the sandy terrain uh, that you find in this sensitive area. And so I think we can move along now to the next slide. And this is one of the many wetlands that you'll find there. It's, uh, I would call it a fen, but I'm not going to bother to uh, define that for you. But, but, uh, but I will tell you that in the spring, it's just loaded with Rodora. It's absolutely gorgeous. And if you want to go down and see interesting wildflowers, the first time is to go in the spring. They're absolutely gorgeous. And there you find sand violets you don't see any other place, or only in very sandy areas. And all kinds of wonderful uh, spring flowers. Please remember not to pick them and never dig them. Dig them. This is a conserved area. And although it's managed for us, that's fine. The rest of it is concerned. So, that's an interesting view of one of the wetlands, and we'll move on now to see the second. And this is a little blurry, but it's, and it's hard to discern 
But if you notice this, this is, oh my gosh, it's flooded. And about here is the water line. Uh, and this is the reflection of the dead trees. Good heavens, what's going on? And this I observed at the end of August. Good grief. And this had been sort of a swamp with shrubs and Burgess Brook had wound through it. So I figured go along just a little bit and look to the north and see what the north looked like. And so we'll look at the northern. It is. It's a pond. Look at that. Who done it? Beaver? Maybe beaver? And I wondered, because this was a very new development. And interestingly enough, Burgess Brook winds through this, then goes down quite a steep slope to the Crooked River, empties into the Crooked River. But it, under, it goes underneath the Jugtown Road in a beautiful old stone culvert, which I would suspect was built in the early 20th century. Lovely culvert. Was that culvert plugged because the road was being slightly washed out by a, a small trickle that you could easily over, but with a heavy rain, you might have a serious washout. And I did let uh, Hancock and Bumper know about that. So, what was going on? I got to find the end, get to the bottom of this mystery, and we go to the next slide. Wow, there's your answer. <laughs> Alder, cut off by a beaver, right close to that culvert. There you are, Well, that's interesting. And I contacted Hancock Lumber, and to my joy, they turned me over to Nick Edwards, who's here at this present. And I asked him, could you track the beaver if you want to get rid of them and bring them out to Coon Swamp? We desperately need them. And so I think that that is yet to be negotiated. But I hope that if we can't get those beaver, um, that we can find some others to import into Coon Swamp. And my only concern is if that work of the beaver is left untouched in that area, that that section of uh, the old Jucktown Road will wash out completely. So, so we'll move on now from the beaver to a strange opening in the vegetation, and this is along the edge of the Jugtown Road. And this was done by the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Conservation. They were trying to uh, rejuvenate that poor uh, uh, pitch pine population, which is rapidly disappearing. And they had cut a clearing here just to see if they could encourage regrowth of pitch pine. So we've got to ask ourselves, if pitch pine is the signature species of this relic population in this tiny refugia of Jugtown, what are the requirements of this strange flora that dates back to the Ice Age? First, they grow in sand, and sand is very nutrient-poor, so that they can survive in nutrient-poor soil, and they do not care for rich humus. Secondly, uh, they have to be able to survive flooding, you know, sand, well, the expression shifting sands, in, it, it will shift easily, and one of the nice uh, descriptions and examples of that is Sable Island off the, uh, the coast of Nova Scotia. You can't put a latitude and a longitude on Sable Island because it shifts this way, that way, dunes build up here, dunes wash away there. And so any farm that has established there has got to be able to withstand flooding and extreme drought. 
And if you are able to withstand extreme drought, what else have you got to be able to withstand or be somewhat resistant to? Get a very dry summer, hot, dry summer, what do you expect? Fire. Fire. And so it has some of it, has to, and a lot of it is able to withstand fire, which is very amazing. I'll give you two examples. The pitch pine is the outstanding example that a white pine just does not like fire. It destroys the roots, it's hard to regenerate. Pitch pine, as long as the fire isn't too intense, and any very intense fire destroys everything, but if it's not too intense, the roots will survive and it will snap right back. Also, the interesting business about pitch pine is that the Cones mostly form on the other trees, and they just stay there undeveloped for years. And then, when you get a fire, these cones open. The heat opens them, called serotonous cones, and it drops its seeds. Now, if you look in the, one of the packages there, of the cone of the pitch pine that's included. That has a history. Several years ago, I picked it up in, uh, in the junk town, took it home, and put it on the filing cabinet. It was closed, and it was in excellent condition, and I thought this is a good demonstration cone. About six months later, I was pawing from all the junk that's on the top of my filing cabinet to discover that there were seeds all over the place. And my first instinct was a feminine one. And I thought, good God, the cleaning lady hasn't dusted up here for six months. I'm going to get after her for this. And then I suddenly realized, I've got a treasure. i got a whole lot of, of wonderful, viable pitch pine seeds. So, on that trip, when we took in the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Conservation, we had a uh, ceremonial tossing of all those seeds. And we tossed them all over the place, and, but in a particular area, and said a prayer that they would survive. Because one of the things that's curious about pitch pine, and I have a difficulty wrapping my brain about is that unlike other pines, deer love to eat the pine seedlings. Well, here this poor pine species is trying to survive in an oncoming forest, and at the same time, if you do get it going, the deer eat the baby seedlings. And so, they sort of shook their heads. They did come up and they did beautifully for a couple of years, but when they were high enough to browse, they disappeared. And I went down just the end of this August, and I found one, and I think we can flip to the next slide, and there is a picture. We'll first look at the picture of the contorted nature of the pitch pine. Uh, it's hard to discern which is which, but the pitch pine, and I hate to leave the uh, loudspeaker for you, does not have a symmetrical growth. It sort of grows this way, that way, the other way, it's con and the technical term is it's contorted. Whereas red pine and white pine is sort of harmonious, uh, graceful, symmetrical, and uh, so you can quite see the difference. It's interesting. Now, let's go to the next slide. And the next slide, you can see more of the white pine, particularly in this area here, uh, how graceful, how symmetrical that is, whereas the pine on the left so I hear 
is much more irregular and contoured. Uh, so that there are the morphological differences. Now, let's continue on and take a look at the bark of the pitch pine. And the bark of the pitch pine is very similar to that of the red pine or Norway pine in the fact that it has heavy plates. Uh, the plates of the pitch pine are thicker and the furrows between are deeper. And you will notice that by and large, the color of the plates is a sort of grayish black. It can almost approach a black. And uh, whereas the red pine has thinner plates, the fissures are not quite as deep, and uh, there is a pronounced reddish tinge to the bark. And another very curious thing about the bark of the pitch pine and the trunk, and I tried to find a, a tree to designate this and to describe it, but I couldn't, is that suddenly, just out of the trunk, you get a little fascicle of needles, not on a stick or a branch. They're just coming out like a few, you know, a few hairs you forgot, the man forgot to shave off. I mean, they look bizarre, and that certainly does not occur on the red pine. Let's go ahead again. And here is the, I caught up with myself, and there, is the tiny little seedling. That's a late bloomer, but that's a little seedling of the pitch pine that finally got going and bloomed this year and started to grow. And I don't know whether it will survive or not. And But it's almost too early to identify precisely which pine it is, but it was just in the area that we had uh, sort of uh, thrown out the seeds, hoping they'll grow. Okay, we can go ahead on to the next one. And there you'll see Mayflower, her nice old friend, the Mayflower, and a typical two or three year old white pine seedling, which you would know very well. So, all right, we'll continue on again. And here is the edge of this opening, this artificial opening uh, fixed up by the Conservancy and the Nature, um, the, the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Conservation. And you can see in the center there, uh, maybe Dave can point it out, the tallest central tree there is the typical red pine. They uh, often grow very straight, even straighter than that. They're wonderful lumber. They're harder than uh, the uh, uh, white pine, uh, a little less susceptible to rot. But uh, none of that contorted nature of the pitch pine. And you can see numerous white pines, small and large, surrounding. And one thing I should mention in regard to early settlement here, what we all know about the King's Pines, the mass, the uses of white pine from our history, but what was red pine used for? And red pine initially was considered a very valuable tree because it's full pitch and it done wrong. And initially, the early settlers thought, wow, this will be marvelous for a shipbuilding, the sailing ships, the wooden sailing ships. And they tried it, and they found, yep, it doesn't rot, and it's, it's very waterproof, but it has a fatal flaw. It, it splinters easily and fragments easily. So if you knock the door on the wharf, as you're trying to dock your vessel, you may be in trouble. <laughs> so that idea was dropped. And, uh, but I wondered if that was one of the reasons that they were drawn to that area, the settlement settlers. Oh my, this is an unusual tree and wonderful for naval building. But to this day, 
the pitch of the pitch time and the derived turpentine are still called naval supplies. And for during the years of the sailing ships, they were used in ship, sailing ship building, which is extremely interesting. Now it's pretty much used as fat wood. During the 20th century, it produced with a lot of some the sum of southern pines, it uh, produced turpentine. And you can see here the tremendous growth of the young white pine. Now, it was the hope of the Nature Conservancy that uh, they, uh, Hancock, would uh, encourage the growth of the pitch pine. And the only way that really is effective to encourage the growth is a controlled burn because uh, white pine doesn't like fire. Red pine tolerates it poorly. Pitch pine flourishes after a fire. And interestingly enough, I heard the mention earlier of the Brownville of uh, fire in the 1940s, along the same time that Bar Harbor uh, burned. And you should go over and see the pitch pine now. It's gorgeous. And look and go in and drive that road into the Freiburg Airport, and you'll see that bare oak and that pitch pine just thriving because of the fire. And you go down to the Kennebunk Sand Plains and see the, all these species plus the barrel. Why? Because the Nature Conservancy controls it and has yearly control burns in various spots. But Kennebunk here is holding a lot of land, and pit, uh, the white pine is their money crop. And so in some senses, I can't blame them because they don't want fire down there. It would do them enormous financial harm. And also, another thing I thought of, uh, apropos of the Alberta tar sands, we've got those pipelines going right along the edge, and in parts, a power line through there too. I mean, you've got serious modern considerations to think about if you're going to introduce any kind of fire. And so maybe, maybe we will have to kiss this relic for a goodbye. I don't know. It will be interesting to see how things develop. And in the meantime, as I say, do go over and um, take a look at not only Junktown, but also go over to Freiburg and, and Brownfield because it's wonderful to see all that marvelous pitch pine growing very well over there. And one thing too is that there are a lot of interesting birds, moths, butterflies, some insects that are specific to um, pine barrens, and uh, we're losing some of this stuff. Eric Dibner, I see, is here, and he told me that he lived near the Jugtown Plains in his youth, and he could remember the whippoorwill singing every, down, every night down in the Jugtown. Who heard a whippoorwill this past summer? Raise your hand. I haven't. When I first moved here in 2002, the first two summers, I heard a whippoorwill once or twice, but I haven't heard them since. We're losing an awful lot down there, but maybe, maybe it's just a part of ecological development. And let's go on to the last couple of slides. Here you see the white pine are naturally just moving right in. And why? Because it's sandy soil. They love sandy soil too. And uh, it's just a perfect environment for them. 
And if you look into the future, the future environment uh, says that we will have a slightly warmer but a much damper climate. And these drives, sand plains, are doomed. I'm afraid they are. So let's continue on and look at a couple of the lovely uh, coastal plain flora. This is sweet fern. Now tell me, is it a true fern? No. No, we forget. It's very closely related to dogbane, which has narcotic <coughs> possibilities and also to marijuana and uh, sort of unlikely cousins. Okay, let's continue. And here is a picture which I'm doesn't have, do half the justice that Jean's wonderful picture of blueberry does. Here's blueberry, and there's blueberry all over the Jugtown Plains. And I think we will hold on to it because it's a, it's a food crop, and we prize it. And there's tons of sand still, still in Maine. And you can regenerate it with fire. It's one of these fire regenerating plants. So that will last. Let's go on again further. And we will notice that the area is getting rapidly cluttered up with um, white uh, wire birch and a small uh, growth of that side. Wire birch loves to invade. Uh, open spaces. It's a pioneer plant and it only lives about 30 years. But you can see we've got small little white pine there. They just love that white pine. It's, they grow like weeds. Let's continue. And finally, my final remark is that uh, Jugtown is losing its relict population and it is returning to the Acadian forest. And the Acadian forest is the forest that you have pretty much around southern and central Maine, which is a transition zone between the eastern deciduous forest and the northern boreal forest. And so I don't think that we will have the pitch pine here indefinitely. We may have to go down to the Mecca for the pitch pine, which is down in southern New Jersey and the Jersey Pine Barrens. There it reaches its apex. And thank you very much, and I hope I haven't gone on too long. And
continuum seekers throughout um, the Joe County area. Um, so it's just kind of a summary. Uh, the Joe County Plains have been an important part of the cultural landscape of the towns of Casco, Ordersfield, Naples for many generations. Residents of the area have always enjoyed the diverse recreation opportunities available in the Jugtown area. The forests of Jugtown have also been an important component of the Hancock family's timberland ownership since the establishment of the family business in 1848. In the year 2000, the Hancock Land Company entered into a conservation easement agreement with the Nature Conservancy and the State of Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands to preserve the unique character of Job Downs working for us. This agreement provides public recreation access for activities such as hunting, canoeing, fishing on the Crooked River, snowmobiling, dog sledding, hiking, blueberry picking, horseback riding, and various other traditional activities. The agreement also protects 269 acres of a rare pitch pine heat forest community. The other nearest representative of such a community is in Clintonville, New York, over 300 miles away. The Jugtown Conservation Easement is a major step towards fulfilling Hancock Land Company's stated mission to vigorously promote a critical mass of multiple-use native forest systems sustainable within and across generations. The following is a summary of the activities allowed and restricted within the conservation easement. The general public shall be permitted pedestrian access for the purposes of hunting, hiking, nature observation, trapping, and fishing. Sustainable forest management within the 3,012-acre forest management area is allowed. No commercial, industrial, or residential developments use, uses are allowed. Harvesting of timber in the 269-acre pitch pine management area is subject to a joint management plan prepared by Hancock Land Company and the Nature Conservancy. No removal of topsoil, sand, gravel, minerals, or other materials except in the normal course of timber har harvesting operations. Clear cutting is not allowed, and protection of many rare plant communities that harbor rare species. So our, our goal is to continue our stewardship management for generations to come. And as you can see in some of our Pixie's pictures, we have like a three-stage forest, the seedlings, the pole-sized bands, and the saw timber. So it kind of goes in a cycle. We'll, we'll harvest the saw timber, and we're always, always keeping everything growing. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not used to, used to standing up in front of you. <laughs> so I guess that's all I got. Unless they have questions. What kinds of management controls have been necessary to uh, keep the place from getting trash? I know um, you put in some gates and you have rules, or uh, and how do you address the public's uh, interest in just going there willy nilly? Um, usually we have um, signs put up, you know, um, no trash and, and that stuff, but that's actually part of my job, is, and I can tell you how much trash and tires and stuff that I've picked up. Um, and we, we also like the, the community that uses it, the people that use it to, to also, you know, call us if you see anything and we'll go get it, and, you know, because we're not out there probably as much as you guys are. Um, but it's definitely an issue. Um, I know the Nature Conservancy does an awful lot of education in certain areas. How do they, I mean, I know they're involved in conservation, but how are they involved in sort of working with the public? Um, I don't think there's a, a lot of the nature conservancy doesn't really do much for the public as far as that goes. Well, in New Jersey, I mean, they may have beautiful land where they have brochures and um, you know kiosks and maps. Right. And yeah, and we kind of we kind of took into um, you know as far as you can go on the internet, Jugtown Forest, and we put up kiosks. I actually built those, and we're trying to get more of the public kind of um, the good people out there so we can kind of everyone get together and, and, and make it that, that type of land that isn't getting abused and trashed and, and stuff like that. So the conservancy has no financial no. involvement at all? 
it's where we're fully financed, like all the stuff that we've done and, and try to keep everything cleaned up, it's, it's all on our plate. I've noticed a big, I live right on the edge of the Jumptown Forest and Castle, right yeah. on the East Falls Road, and I've noticed a big difference since you put the road all up your cable lines up and your gates, and I've noticed a lot less trash on the fields. Yeah. And um, I've noticed a lot less kids out there riding their cars. Right. You know? Yeah, we, we have, um, our, our rules are no vehicles. Um, and. We allow ATVs. Sometimes I would much rather not have any ATVs out there, but that's that's um, that's our rules, and we have them set because they do a lot of damage, like Pixie said, a lot of erosion problems and stuff. So the company is doing all the repairs on that, or is that the four wheeler and the snowmobile club are doing it? Um, the four wheeler and snowmobile clubs are supposed to be. They they do a lot of it. They do pay for loads of gravel and signage and stuff like that, but the rest of it's all us. Okay. I know it's still say, yeah, the bridge near the transfer station was out for a while. It's kind of key. Now, like, what would the hand cut? Would we build that bridge or the snowmobile club? Snowmobile club. Yeah, snowmobile club. Snowmobile club. Like I said, the snowmobile clubs in, in all three towns maintain they're supposed to maintain all the ATV trails and, and stuff like that. Um, and that uh, your gate thing, I was telling him, um, we must spend six hundred dollars a year just on replacing blocks that are cut on gates. Mm -hmm. People going in. So. Used to <clears throat> be that back in the hunting season, you're in November. They used to take the gates and open them, and the cables down to uh, access for these sportsmen to go in and hunt. But yeah. now they, they don't do that. Well, we do um, certain ones um, on the Jugtown Road where she lives. We open the gate during hunt season. Um, on the East Falls Road. Yeah, on the East Falls Road, the two main gates we do. And they do the one that goes up to where Jugtown is. There's that one gate. The metal gates, the swingers. They don't take the cable ones down because those are next to the private landowners, pretty much. Yeah, the butts. The butts and, did they used to take them down somewhere else? They yes, they them? did. Where was that? Uh, up, up in Spurs Corner. They oh, yeah. They drew them up there on Oak Hill. And then up, there, up on top of uh, Jordan Mountain, they, there's a swinging gate there that they used to open up and let access to the hunters go down in, and they, and they, and they stop that. Yeah, I think, I think they're kind of leaning towards two main accesses for hunters to go in, and not, it leaves more of an opportunity for abuse to the land. Nick, I just wanted to say that one of the wonderful things about Hancock and all that land is it provides us with an enormous, valuable, green space and that's huge and as Maine develops and our population increases you will be so glad that that has been preserved as a large green space and it also does another very important thing it protects the area around the Crooked River which flows through uh, that southern section of Jugtown because the Crooked River, as you probably all know, is extremely important because it is the water supply for Greater Portland. For and, uh, yeah, and the greater the amount of the forested uh, area you can keep around the Crooked River, the purer the water will be as it flows in. It's the main contributory into Sebago Lake. So I think we should thank one with Hancock for all it does in that respect. And I think another few things that we can do is we can continue to pry into the history and enjoy that. And thirdly, to try with Hancock to keep it clean, well kept, pristine, and uh, a gem that we can all enjoy, even though we may have lost the pitch pine, it still is extremely valuable. 
It's a wonderful bird preserve. Turkeys and a lot of the wild birds that I haven't seen. The eagles, the hawks, they're coming back. Yeah, they there's, there was actually an article I read the other day. Um, I think some uh, professor wrote it in the course of business, and he was saying that New England has kind of come back, and, and this, you know, look at all the turkeys you see, and all the wildlife, and, and all this different stuff, and, and that, you know, everything's coming back. Well, lots of rough grouse. Yeah, yeah, I was actually in Goat Town the other day, um, and I couldn't believe every, everywhere I go, I was flying off. Okay, so are there other Hancock preserves or the land share program that are under your uh, um, work? Or are you just doing Jeff Town Plain? No, uh, we, uh, we actually own 12,000 acres. It's all open to the public for recreation and hiking and the same stuff that the drug town is open to. Do you have the mark trails like you do out here? No, we don't. That, that was something that we did just specifically to try to, like I said, basically the pictures you see from 96 to now is to draw these, I don't know how to explain it, better people so that we can kind of push out those people and, and and treat the land the way it's supposed to be treated. Take a plastic bag with you and pick up any trash you see. I mean, <laughs> all this helps. We actually, we've gotten together with, uh, not so much at Whiskey, I haven't seen many tires, but uh, I'm constantly picking up tires and then we got together with the town and like, you know, Naples and Casco. We bring these to the dump for free because the reason people are dumping them is because it's costing them money to dump them here. And they, they've been really good. Um, are you seeing any bittersweet or are you seeing any bittersweet or any other invasive species of note being joked down plants? The only area which I saw a lot of invasives uh, is right at the very end down at the Eats Fall and where you have the remnants of farmhouses and it's very obvious that they were all farms because you can see old apple trees and old rose bushes. And the only thing that's really obnoxious there, and I hope it doesn't move further northward, are those two a species of bittersweet. Mm -hmm. uh, not bittersweet, I'm sorry, a honeysuckle. The honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I have not seen bittersweet in there. That's good. Yeah. I love the That's the one nice possible. <laughs> but I haven't combed that southern area for invasives, I was looking more for the unusual sand-related plants further north. And Pixie, back here, um, the swamp there where they're killing the trees and the beavers and stuff, um, I got together with um, the state and we actually went out and we pulled that stuff out of that culvert and everything's flowing fine now and um, when traffic season comes we're going to have traffic going in and trap those out. Thank you.